Hi, I'm Michael Cortese of Noble Spirit in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And I'm Charles Epting of H.R. Harmer in New York City. And this is Conversations with Philatelists. Michael, who we're talking to today is somebody I'm very excited to talk about, um, not just because of her role in the hobby and not just because of um, the great events that she helps put on in her role um, as executive director of the ASDA, but Dana Geyer is genuinely one of the most fun people to talk to that I know. Yeah, she's funny, energetic, and just... Um just really drags you into her experience in the hobby and, and, and wants it to be a positive experience for everyone she talks to. Absolutely. I, I know that if I have a phone call lined up with Dana, it's going to be um, equal parts business and just laughing hysterically. Yeah, exactly. That's just the kind of person Dana is. So I'm yeah. really excited to have her on uh, with us today. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And But in addition to you know, her cheerful demeanor, she's got a lot of important things to say, uh, you know, as, you know, executive director of the ASDA. I mean, she absolutely. And and, and she uh, was the, the show's chairman with the APS before that. Um, when it comes to putting on a successful stamp show, I think uh, there's a lot that can be learned from Dana. I think she really um, has it figured out as, as well as anyone these days. Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested to hear what they're doing to help people it, during these times. It's tough. The ASDA, you know, the, the APS, um, you know, fortunately they have a magazine they can send out to members. They, um, you know, the, there's a lot of different ways they can get in touch, but when the ASDA is tasked with, and for those of you who don't know, the ASDA is the American Stamp Dealers Association. Um, it's a much different task to, you know, there's people who don't have computers. There's people who won't be able to attend a show. I mean, right now there's really no shows on the horizon. Hmm. I think it's really uh, difficult and trying to be in Dana's shoes right now. Um, again, trying to ensure that these dealer, these dealers who are the backbone of the hobby, um, you know, not only survive but prosper. How can she help? I, I want to know how she can help them, um, you know, really uh, take their business into the 21st century into a post-COVID-19 world. Right, right. I'm really grateful that she's taking the time out to do this because. She must be incredibly busy. I can only imagine what's on her plate. Right, right. Well, um, let's bring her in. Let's bring her in. I can't wait. Dana. Hi. How are you doing, Dana? I'm good. I'm working in my house instead of in my office because it was struck by lightning. So um, oh, it wow. blew out my internet line. It, the lightning came right out the internet line. That's a good, <laughs> that uh, that's a good summary of how things are going this year. Mm. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Yeah, so that's always fun. You guys, well, thank, you for jo- thank you for joining us. behind you and, you know, auction yeah. catalogs, and I have my niece's artwork. <laughs> <laughs> well, how are things going? We spoke on the phone a couple of weeks ago, and, um, and, and we had a bit of a chat, but I think for our listeners, can you talk a little bit about what it is the ASD? Because a lot of people are members of the APS. Everybody gets what the APS does. But the ASDA, unless you're a dealer, might be a bit foreign. Can you talk a little bit about what it is the ASDA does under the best of circumstances <laughs> and what it is the ASDA has been doing um, these last couple of months to sort of think outside the box? Oh, well, <laughs> we're, we, yeah. well the ASDA uh, does multiple things. Um, well, we, we have show dealers. We have internet dealers that have their own web-based uh, websites. They also sell on eBay, Hip Stamp, Del Campe. So they, and they also sell on Stamp Store, the APS. So they do a w- range of things. And until everything happened, they all, a lot of them, travel. And they, we have auction dealers, of course, as well. But they, they would travel. And they could travel up to 30, 40, 50 shows or more a year, depending on their schedule. Or they could limit that and do, say, 15 shows a year, 10 shows a year, just depending on what they would want to do. Um, Someone like, say, Mr. Dempsey, he used to do say 30, 40, 50 shows a year. He scaled back, of course, because of his age, and he stays more on the West Coast now. Um, Michael Ball would do 30, 40 shows a year. Eric Jackson, he may do 10 or 12 shows a year, but he also has a big internet presence. And he does online internet sales and does 
also auctions. Every three weeks, he'll do an online auction as well um, with his product. So we have a, a cross of uh, a big cross section of dealers and they'll look to us to help them promote them, help um, people will call into us, they'll email us, they'll actually contact us through Facebook and they'll ask us questions on who they can get in contact with to sell product, who they can get in contact with to give them information about what they have, how they can um, learn more about what they what they have as well, um, to advance in their their hobby, or maybe they're starting something new. So they also contact to contact us that for that for that as well. So it's pretty diverse, but they they also even with um, what's going on now, they're still contacting us because they still want to buy they still want to sell and so they're contacting us and they're trying to figure out the customers are still trying still trying to figure out how to get to the clients so without shows and that all happened very quickly and we were kind of watching the wave come this direction we started to react and we have a database of over 15,000 email addresses and we can send e-blasts out to those people and we can contact those people. And then we have our dealer base too. So we started to react to that. We started sending out information saying, you know, you need to pay attention to our website. Our dealers are open 24 hours a day. They're online you can reach them by phone, by email. You can look at their websites. The ones that don't have websites don't have e access like that don't those must online. be the toughest ones to work with uh during a time like this because again right. under normal circumstances right. they can still network go to shows meet people um right what, what sort of things are you doing again if somebody has no web presence how are you reaching out to them so they started to get very scared and they started calling me and i was getting calls every day of the week every hour of the day <laughs> And I said, look, here's what you have to do. You have to, you have to let us help you. You have to let us put together an e-blast and send it out to these people. It, our e-blasts do cost money, but we did cut them in half for them, took them down to half price. And we said, you have to send these out to people. Just get your information out, get your phone number out, your email out and send out an e-blast to 15,000 people send it out. You're going to get a return on that. They were so, some people didn't want to do it, but the people that did it were so surprised in the return. They called me the next day or two days later and they said, I can't believe the people that called me. I can't, they emailed me. They said, I can't believe the people, I had, the people that they hadn't talked to in years that they couldn't, that they didn't reach at shows anymore. They couldn't believe it. Some of these people actually told me that they may not do as many shows anymore <laughs> because they are doing so much business. A gentleman that does shows all the time. He doesn't necessarily do APS shows. He doesn't do ASDA shows. He doesn't do WSP shows. He does these little tiny shows here and there, tiny ones. 10 or 15 dealers all over the place. He does these little shows. He's not going to do shows anymore. He's just going to do this. He put together scanned pages of items. He started out with four pages. He sends them to me all the time now. He's up to 30 or 40 pages. He'll send out. People will bid on items through the mail and through email. That's how he does his business right now. Hmm. He's doing just fine. He did one e-blast with us. That's all he needed to do. He may do another one in a couple months. All he did was one. And that's what got him going. He was nervous to do it. But he said, I have to spend the money, but I'm scared to spend the money. And I said, look, how much money do you spend at these 30 shows? Yeah. Spend that little bit of money, which is maybe one or two shows that you would spend. Spend that little bit of money here and it's going to come back to you. And it's come back tenfold to him right now. 
and he's he's tickled pink. And now some of the auction houses are using the e-blast now, and they're showing returns on it. And the auction houses have got inventive, and they've done different things, like they've done YouTube videos to show product. They've done different ways to show things because they can't have people in their actual buildings looking through product. So they've done some different ways um, because in different areas, you know, they're not allowed to have people in the building. Some places are now, but before it was all, you know, they weren't allowed to have anybody in the building. So they had to come up with ways to show the product. And that's what they were doing. They were doing YouTube videos to actually turn the pages show the product, do a visual, and it was working. And it seemed to work. I mean, they were doing workarounds, and it wasn't perfect. And some people were getting angry. Some people were saying, okay, we understand, and it wasn't a perfect world. But if everybody's a little patient as people try new things, patience is kind of the key in this situation because everybody's got to try some new things, get the kinks worked out, and you know, think mistakes are going to happen, errors are going to happen, but, you know, as virtual shows appear, you know, the APS is going to do a virtual show. Mm -hmm. We're going to see how that works. It's, it's going to be a good thing. There may be some kinks, but everybody has to remember there will be kinks and they have to, you know, take a breath, let the kinks get worked out, not get frustrated and just let it kind of move forward that way. Did you did you um, put a lot of um, ASDA dealers who weren't online before in this virtual show for the APS? We've been we've been pushing them toward that so that they can work with APS because they're APS members as well. Right. So we've been pushing them to do that, and we also um, we also put um, a spot in there for the ASDA mm -hmm. so that to direct people back to our membership as well to help them that way. Um, and we've been, any advertising that we can take out anywhere, whether it's in Lens, whether it's online somewhere, we've been directing um, to our membership base in any way we can um, to help any of our members. And we've been doing, um, we did a different type of advertising in our magazine that then crossed over to online. We made ads that were clickable through to people's uh, websites, to their eBay stores, to their hip stamp stores or Del Campe stores, um, so that it could help direct sales to them. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be working. People seem to like that. Um, we've had consistently three pages of advertising in the magazine for that and online, which is nice. Um, and those are for show dealers, um, anybody that would do shows that, that aren't, you know, getting out there at shows. We had an interesting well, conversation a couple of weeks ago, Dana, and I don't want to get too much into the nitty gritty of running a show, but mm -hmm. to a lot of people, it's just, when will the government let us have shows again? When will, uh, right. Governor Cuomo or, you know, um, Governor Newsom allow, permit us. But you were right. talking to me about a lot of the, um, sort of the, the nitty gritty that goes into planning a show these days, things I hadn't thought about, um, like security, like, you know, the temperature checks, all these things. Mm -hmm. When you look forward, um, there's no no checks this year, unfortunately. Looking right. past that, what do you think the future of shows will be? What will it take uh, for you to be comfortable having another ASDA endorsed show in the future? What Where do you think we're headed from here? Obviously, we can't predict the course of the virus, but what are the things right. going through your head as you look forward? Well, I really want to keep, I want to keep the, the collector safe. I want to keep the, the dealer safe. Um, those are my primary, you know, focuses. Um, that's a really hard question. And I watch a lot of news anyway, <laughs> and I watch all, all aspects of news. So um, to, to get all sides. And so I, I watch business news. I'm, I'm so I'm watching even more news now than normal. And depending on how things are going and how how everything's gonna fare, again, the primary concern is safety for everybody. And then 
you're also going to have to follow the guidelines of each state individually and then whatever location you're in whether that's a convention center or a hotel you're going to have to follow those guidelines as well so and you're going to have to adhere pretty stringently to those and the, again the collectors and the dealers are going and and exhibitors are all going to have to be patient especially with the first real solid show out there that that once they start to really open up be patient with how things could change last minute um you could go in and say okay this is what we're this is our plan we have this plan and a week before the plan could change not anything that we've done but the state could change it on us the governor could change it on us the hotel could change it on us and the the, the collectors could get upset with us about that but we have to be willing as a, an organization and as a hobby to kind of flow with this if we really want to have that show in person right and we really have to work together as a complete team and that's when this is when we're going to have to really look at things you know if say either the APS is the first show out of the gate or Foxborough is the first show out of the gate or the ASDA is the first show out of the gate then either one of those three organizations need to really all band together and help each other to make that the best show possible. And if it's the APS show out of the gate, then the ASDA, Boxboro, any other show that has significant force behind them needs to go and, and really help the APS and support them in the best way they can to make that show as physically possible as it can be and as safe and the best quality show it can be too because we as a hobby really want shows what what's really good about this hobby is we we learn from each other we learn best in person when we can actually see when we can actually you know see physically see the pro you know see the product mm -hmm. so seeing this product and touching it and pulling it out with a set of tongs and really looking at it it's hard to do that over zoom it's some some things are hard to do over zoom like that and and so to do that in person is a lot better to have meetings and seminars those are easier over zoom but to see the product that's a little harder i mean people buy things online all the time and they can send them back but People are gonna, they're really hungry for shows. Yeah, it's it's the so connection that, of it too, the, right. in, the in-person connection. We're talking now, but it still has, right. it's just a little different than if we were sitting at a table together. Uh, you right. know, I can talk to anyone over email, but it's just, it's it's not quite the same. You meet the collectors and they, they, they buy more at shows and, uh, you know, from a specific, they, they like meeting you. They like shaking your hand. Right. Right. And, and the other thing is then how some people are wondering, how do we keep this product safe? So if I look at this at a table, yeah. does this get put away then and not shown to anybody else for the duration of the show? Is that a concern right now or not? Um, some people say it is, some people say it isn't, or, yeah. or, or does it get put into a new sleeve? Mm -hmm. Does it have to be, out of a sleeve and put into a new sleeve then for the, yeah. for the you next almost person have to like look a, at. A communal pair of tongs that are then sanitized every time. Uh, right. And, you know. <laughs> right. It's like handing out a pen at a, you know, just having people register yeah. at a show. Everybody gets their own pen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are all sorts of aspects that have to be looked at. And I do think that it it's better that smaller shows start first and kind of get a handle on things because if you have a show that has 10, 15, 20 dealers, you have an easier time handling what's going on. 
that when you're walking into a show with 50, 60, 70, 100 dealers Mm -hmm. where you have the masses. Yeah. So the small, if you can contain a smaller show and handle a smaller show, then you can see what you, you have a better picture of seeing what's going on and getting it. What, getting yeah, it what, right. What works and what doesn't. Right. Right. But we do have to get behind whatever's the first show. Right. Yeah. That's something we've been seeing a lot of is, um, is working together as a hobby, a lot of positivity and people kind of just working, banding together to try and create a more sustainable environment for the, for the hobby, because everybody wants to, to still collect stamps. They still want to buy stuff. They still want to sell stuff. It's just finding the, the, the easiest path to do it. Yeah. And I've noticed a lot of people are buying and a lot of people are not opting out of our emails. They're mm-hmm. all staying in. So, which is, which is good. The hobby, the hobby seems to be really strong right now. Yeah. I mean, people are buying. I don't know what you two are seeing, but. Absolutely. It's, I, I don't yeah. want to speak for Michael, but for us, at least, it's been fantastic lately. It's it's yeah. definitely, you know, the, we're seeing a lot of new customers. We're seeing a lot of customers buying more material than they usually do. Right. And I do think that when there are shows, physical shows in place, no matter what, um, on their websites, I think it's very important to put a link to the state's information and a link to that hotel or convention center's information. So even if, for instance, even if, for instance, I don't have that information readily at my hand 24 seven, somebody can go to our website and see, okay, so no jacks. This is what the governor's saying today. This is what he's saying tomorrow. This is what is happening at the hotel. And these are the criteria right now. And that they're, they're always there ready so that any collector or any dealer can see that information. So it's always there. And I think this is going to have to be something that's into the future. And for how long, I don't know, but it's, it's going to have to be there. I mean, it's ever changing. And what I've noticed is that it's ever changing almost every hour of the day depending on how you listen to it. And with uh, St. Louis, people were calling me about St. Louis constantly, and it was ever-changing in St. Louis every time I looked at the website for the area to give them information. So, you know, we have to be proactive about that. So any show out there, I would advise them to put on their website the link to the state with that pertinent information and the link to the location that they're in about what their rules and regulations are. It just makes sense for them to be as, as active as possible. And then they really, I know that everybody's a volunteer, but they should have at least somebody that could be emailed to keep track of that information to try to help people, which is really hard. Having a source like the ASDA to do exactly what you're saying has been a lifesaver for for some of these dealers we hope i'm gonna give you a little bit of a softball question dana softball <laughs> is probably not <laughs> I, I, that was, that was a very heavy conversation i feel i feel down after talking about that no 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 is the asda an organization for stamp dealers only stamp dealers only and actually well we have hugh wood who's insurance so people that are related to stamp collecting. but well, I, I, I guess my question is the, the magazine that you guys put out is mm-hmm. fantastic. And many of the articles are not related to just, I, I, I think there's this impression, at least I had it early on, that the ASDA is purely a trade organization. Oh. Well, we're a trade organization, but we're, we want you, to appeal to collectors. Correct. And, and you just changed right. the name of the magazine from the American Stamp Dealer and Collector to American Stamp Collector and Dealer, I noticed. Um, but so, we so did this, that a while ago. It took you a while to notice that. Where took you me been? a couple of issues. Well, I don't look at the cover. I, I, the content is so interesting. Yeah. I just blow past the front cover. Um, <laughs> but, but this is an organization that, again, is, is not just for dealers to take notice of or to go to the website right. of. This is a, an organization that appeals to pre-existing collectors 
that right. appeals to maybe somebody inherits a collection, they don't know what to do with it. You're, you're, you're an organization that more people should take notice of, even if you're not a show dealer doing 30 to 40 shows a year. Is correct. that correct? That is correct. Yes, yes, yes. Because we're here for, these are dealer members that are here for the people to help them in any way they can. Um, they, they'll help, they'll actually tell them if they need to, they'll say, you know, don't sell me your things, go, you're here, go see Charles, <laughs> you know, because it's better to have you auction it than it would be for them to buy it and sell it individually or something like that. It's more beneficial to the customer. Sometimes they'll say, well, I'll just put it on consignment for you because you'll make more money that way than you would if I just bought it from you. We're here for the collector base. And um, a lot of, there are a lot of collectors that um, read the magazine. They really, they really like it. And, and you can subscribe really, to the magazine uh, without being a full time, a uh, full ASDM member, correct? Oh, definitely. Yeah. We've probably 2,500 subscribers to the magazine and, and uh, they enjoy it. For people who don't know, how much is the ASDA membership price? Oh, you're going to ask me. Oh, the ASDA for a dealer or for a magazine? Well, both. For, <laughs> <laughs> you're hilarious now now i'm gonna have to look at my notes because i never do the the, the magazine subscriptions because i don't they well, keep well, me away from that money while you're doing that do you get a lot of new uh dealers and people who were collectors and then decided to be get be dealers and then come to you first on advice how to how to do it do you get a lot of those um yeah we do we many because they normally know what they're doing okay. um when they when they become dealers for the most part um they've been doing it for a while but i thought people would slow down and and be scared to actually apply for membership right now and i have three member applications in right now actually um they need online assistance yeah. right now which is good but you can you can uh we have online subscriptions as well, which I think our online membership for the magazine is, I think, nine ninety five or something for a year, eighteen dollars for two years. Well, the magazine subscription is um, thirty two dollars. Ninety five dollars. It's worth it. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I think our regular subscription is uh, what two years for thirty two dollars and a year for twenty three. Mm -hmm. 95 or something like that. It's pretty inexpensive for our magazine. And when you talk we, about the the membership process, the, um, you vet new member applicants, I believe. Correct. At least yes. you vetted. At least you vetted me. Um, oh yes, we we we. <laughs> wait, wait, especially the, the, you. <laughs> this is an organization that really does give you um, legitimacy and reputability if you're a dealer. Um, you know, when, when somebody puts that ASD, when there used to be stamp shops, I know a lot of people would put the sticker in the front window. Now a lot of eBay pages or websites use that ASDA logo because it mm -hmm. means something. It's not just an empty, um, uh, you know, you, you, you really do have a responsibility, I think, to make sure that the people who you permit to be ASDA members um, uphold a certain uh, standard and a certain level of conduct. Right. And, and we worked um, extremely hard with eBay um, to make sure that we were able to um, have our members place that logo beside every product that they put online um, that sell on eBay. Because one of the things we have been working on with, with eBay in particular, which we will we will gladly do with hip stamp or Del Delcampe or any of anybody, which we've talked to them about as well, um, is we've been educating people that buy from eBay or buy online from anyone is to make sure that you're buying from a reputable dealer, one with an ASDA logo. Because if you have a problem or a challenge with one of the members, you can contact us and we will help you work that challenge out. And we have on several occasions. And we just communicate with the two parties. And if there's, if you can't reconcile with us helping you communicate, then you file a complaint. And we take care of it. And you either 
there are multiple levels that you go through, but ultimately it gets worked out and everybody's happy. If it doesn't, well then someone's no longer a dealer and they're just not with us anymore. I mean, that's it helps give people a lot of confidence. I would imagine in an online transaction where again, you sit at a stamp show across the table from somebody, you can feel them out. You have, can be a pretty good judge of character. I right. think that, um, um, you know, something like that ASDA stamp of approval that using that logo um, helps people to, to again, feel more of, comfortable sense with of security. A, exactly. It's absolutely sense of security right. with an otherwise faceless, nameless transaction. Well, I have a lot of dealers that call me up that tell me all the time that the, the money they spend every year is worth it to get even one or two good referrals and using the logo because it's it's worth it even though they have other they get other things for it or advertising and especially right now all the pushes we're doing the extra pushes and everything else we're doing on top of what we would normally do for shows and all the WSP show pushes we do and all the other things we were doing and we've just switched gears they still even just getting one referral would could triple or quadruple what they pay a year in membership easily. And we're constantly getting those every single day. I mean, we get well over 10,000 hits a month on our site, just looking at, just looking at the dealer section. So, mm. I mean, people are constantly surfing and we're constantly getting phone calls, the emails. I mean, they're constantly looking now, whether they're selling, it, it just depends whether they're wanting to buy. You know, they're doing everything now out there. I mean, it's constant. It's amazing how many people are sitting at home buying stamps right now. I can't believe it. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. And they're not, it's not, they're not cheap right now either. They're paying a lot of money for it from what I'm understanding. People are yeah. talking in my ear telling me that they're trying to bid on things and they're being outbid left and right. So... Yeah. I'm not, I think it's pretty interesting to me. We, we, we like those sorts of complaints. <laughs> yeah, we do, right? I'm, I'm very happy about it because I was, I, right at the beginning, I was getting nervous and now everybody's telling me that they're getting outbid for things. So that makes me happy. That means the dealers and people, dealers are making money and the collectors are happy because they're buying product. Mm -hmm. So it's a win-win. Can you explain the process of going, attending an online stamp show? For somebody who might yeah. be unfamiliar with the concept, who's used to going to in-person stamp shows, what can they expect? Um, and obviously, we've got the big APS show coming up. But on the on the ASDAs, and what 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 uh, what can people look to you guys for these days? I'm not sure, 100 percent yet. <laughs> um, people need to be patient, <laughs> right? But um, what we're actually uh, I'm working, Barb Ball is one of our volunteers, and one of the things we're working on next, which um, we haven't even rolled out to the dealers yet, is a, um, a Zoom option where it's not necessarily a show, but we're going to work with the dealers, limit it to maybe 10 or 15 of them, and we want the dealers to be able to interact one-on-one -on -one or in groups small groups with people and we want them to be able to show product. We want them to be able to sit in their office and actually try to show some product in, a, in Zoom meetings, schedule them. So we're going to try to do that with the ones that actually can handle doing Zoom and are comfortable with it and see how that goes and just work with them and tell them we'll advertise them and when this is going to happen and see how that goes. And then we're going to work up to the next step, which would be more of a show, but where they can actually show product and things. Where well, right now, I think the APS's show is they have um, online presence with free advertising of the um, people's websites and different key specialties, things like that. And then I think the next level up is they can pay for advertising in front of um, seminars and things. I'm going to try to work on a show where our members can actually physically show some product that people can click through and then potentially schedule Zoom meetings from those pages. 
And that's a little more complicated because our member base is all at different levels. Mm -hmm. And I have to be just as patient with them as they have to be with me because we need to, if somebody doesn't know how to do it, we have to train them before they actually do it to make sure that they're comfortable doing it too. So we'll have to have test runs with them before they actually do it with an, an actual client and before we make the show live. So I want to have an, an interactive page with some of their product and with them being, being able to do schedule zoom meetings too. So that's what I'd like to do. And those... I don't know if it's going to be possible, but we'll see. Those shows would be open to essentially the general public, not just ASDA members. Right. Anybody. Yep. Anybody that wants to buy anything. It seems like Which, a lot of people do. Yeah. So it's been a, it's been a hard road, and I've taken uh, actually I've logged on to several web webinars um, for associations, and I've stumped them with a lot of questions actually, and I have a meeting. Um, next Tuesday morning with someone who's going to call me directly about what I've been talking about. So we'll see how that goes, but pretty much we've been kind of on our own. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the dealers we've had on uh, email feeds, about 80 or 90 dealers on email feeds with opinions and um, different thoughts. And they've been excellent, excellent feedback from them. Um, it's been all all levels, all over the page, all levels. Um, so it's it's been really good feedback on it. Um, hopefully we can pull off some of what they want. Some of them want to go for miles and put a lot of product up. Mm -hmm. But I think we're going to have to limit that to a certain amount of product. I don't think we're going to be able to put hundreds of things up. They're going to have to really limit that. It might be, you know, 25 items and then there, people are going to have to actually zoom in and, and ask for specific thing, you know, send maybe basically ask for a want list and then they're going to have to get on a zoom meeting and talk about what those items are then. So it's going to be a little more challenging, but I think it's going to give them a better maybe connection one-on-one -on -one then to zoom. So we'll see. I'm going to ask you, it's, I feel like I've been asking everybody this question, but it's kind of becoming okay. my, my signature uh, question. Oh, <laughs> um, great. <laughs> when the virus passes, when it is safe to gather again, when um, we can have ASDA shows and APS shows again, when um, whatever the new normal is, it'll be different than things are right now. What do you think the lasting repercussions of these last six months will be? what do you think the legacy of COVID-19 will be in the hobby in terms of how it pushes people towards digital permanently? You said there's people who um, no longer want to do shows because they're having so much success with their computers. How do you think this virus, um, you know, we, we've heard from people that it may force a lot of things to the forefront that were maybe, maybe people were putting them off. Maybe people were, dragging their feet getting a website or dragging their feet selling on eBay. And maybe this is the little kick they needed. Um, how much of the hobby do you think is going to go back to normal versus how much do you think COVID will permanently impact the future of philately? I think there will be fewer dealers doing shows now. And I think that's twofold. I think one is because they've gotten online and they're seeing how that finally is working for them. So they'll cut back and they'll do fewer shows. Um, they'll still do some, but they'll do fewer. Um, and then the other one is, I think the new normal will probably still include some masking and things. So because of that, I've actually heard from several dealers, they will not do shows wearing masks. They do not feel comfortable having to wear a mask for that period of time and have to do that, especially with the other person wearing a mask. And I didn't delve into that a great deal with them. I don't know whether it's because they don't like that or they don't feel a safety or whether it's they just don't like to wear masks. They're not comfortable. So I think that our 
smaller shows are going to have trouble filling shows. I think the New York area is going to have an incredibly hard time having a show currently and in the near future at least because of what's happening in that area currently um, until they get New York straightened out. And I've heard from dealers that won't go into the New York area to do a show until they straighten it out. So there could be other areas that they won't feel comfortable going into to do a show, which means the collector base won't feel comfortable going into it. Even after the new normal happens, the areas have to revitalize in order for the collector base to feel comfortable to go back there. Because if there's no place to really eat or gather or the spouses to do things in that during the day, then the collectors aren't going to go as well. You, you have to think about the whole picture. So if I'm going to a stamp show and my spouse is coming with me, which normally that's what happens when you go to a show, my spouse is going to give me a hard time if there's nothing to do in that area. And right now, these areas are having a hard time regenerating. And if they're not going to be revitalized under the new normal right away, then our collectors might not show. I mean, but you have to think of the, you have to think of the whole Absolutely. thing because when I book a location, when I would book a location for a show, you have to book the whole. So you see the integration of, uh, mass emails and Zoom as potentially being permanent or, or at the very least long standing. It's it's not like we're right. going to switch obviously and go back to shows. I, I at least from everyone we've spoken to and my right. own um, my own thought is that these again it'll be great to get back down to the collectors club for a meeting again someday. Right. But I'm sure that a lot of these places are going to continue broadcasting their meetings on Zoom. They're going to continue when you talk about showing stock via Zoom. I'm sure that there will be a new, um, and even once there are shows, certainly not in New York City anytime soon, but right. one, once there is a show, I'm sure there will be some um, relics of the COVID days, some, you know, some uh, additional web presence or an additional video conferencing presence. Right. I think that all this will be integrated into the new mm -hmm shows like, right. like wade even said the other in the other interview that the collectors club was voting on making the the virtual uh speeches uh and presentations permanent yeah yeah because wade and so i briefly successful. talked about that as well yeah shows will will not be the same after this i think that as much as we all want to get back um um back on on a on a bourse floor um there will be long-standing repercussions and again i think a lot of things that maybe should have happened a long time ago and everyone was reluctant or wasn't comfortable enough with the technology and this has been sort of a, a sink or swim sort of scenario for people right and you know long term you know hotels and convention centers may mandate certain requirements for conventions that may change the whole demographic of a show you know we we may be be mandated to not just have the plexi on the on the on the base to cover the product we may be mandated to have at least one piece of plexi straight up we, we could be mandated to that you know and, and that's not cheap i've priced it mm -hmm. so you know we, we could be mandated to have extra hand sanitizers uh, you know stations or we you know there could be certain things that we could be mandated to adhere to regulations that guide us into the future that some smaller shows couldn't handle you know couldn't afford um that might need to seek donations for or support for from you know other groups or assistance helping and that's why i was saying that you know, the first show out, we would need to collectively get together and, and help, you know, if, for instance, maybe the dealer advisory committee, that's where we could, you know, put heads together and, and help in, in that area and, and think about how to help those shows and help the WSP shows survive. 
Well, once there is um, more forward progress, both on the virtual shows and physical shows, once we have an update, we'd love to have you back on to yeah. catch up and, uh, and, and see, where things, see where things are going. Because, again, there, there's – it, it, it's it's um it, it's a lot of speculation right now and it'll be interesting to see where where we end up in a couple of months so we'd love to follow back up with you once um once we know what direction shows in the hobby you're headed yeah that'd, that'd be, be fun that'd be great well dan this was fantastic thank you so much for talking with us this was a lot of fun um you're always good for uh, information and a laugh at the same time. So thank you for joining us. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. And and thank you for what you've been doing this entire time uh, to, to help dealers and collectors get together and, and find an easy way to continue what they're so passionate about. We know you've been well, holding a lot of hands, so thank you for that. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you guys having me on. It was great. Absolutely. Well, we'll um, talk to you soon then. All right, thanks. All right. Thanks, Dana. Bye. All right, bye-bye. That was great. That was as enjoyable as I hoped and expected it would be uh, catching up with Dana and and certainly a unique perspective to have nowadays, um, seeing as she is so involved in so many shows normally. Yeah, yeah, that was terrific. And, and it's great to hear she's been doing s- such hard work for these dealers and these collectors to allow them to continue their, their hobby. And, and it's a direction we eventually, again, needed to take, but it's good to have her there to help guide people because without without her without the asda that a lot of people wouldn't be able to do it so easily to have someone as nice as her doing it too um right. you know, a, lot, a lot of people um you know won't mind um her nudging them along or pushing them mm-hmm. in, the, in the right direction i think she's a great force for good in the hobby yeah because she just wants people to succeed is the thing um, it, she, she wants every you know a rising tide lifts all boats I've exactly probably said that on a majority of the episodes now <laughs> could be a closer um, but, but 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 I think that that's particularly true for for Dana. She needs every dealer to succeed. She needs the collectors to succeed in the shows. For the ASDA to exist, everybody needs to be profiting. Right. Uh, so I think she's in a great position to again help everyone. Exactly. So so before we wrap up, before we conclude here today, um, what's on the agenda for next week? I think this is an exciting one. Yeah, next week we've got um, Graham Beck. I. Th- think you've heard of them before i have i think uh most anyone um who collects stamps and has a facebook page or a youtube account uh has hopefully heard of him because he has managed to utilize social media instagram youtube um in a way that that few others have been able to um really harness that um i i think uh he's he's one of the few who's been successful at integrating philately with 21st century social media right. so it, it, not, not only have i heard of him it's it's uh hard to have not heard of him hard right. hard to avoid him on social media yeah he was a, a trailblazer in the regard of youtube because he was actually the first youtube channel with a focus on stamps i did uh, not know that in, yeah i, 20, I, I, I know he's certainly the certainly the most prominent but i didn't realize he was the first as well yeah that's exciting i can't wait to talk to graham if people want to listen to us they can find us on apple podcast youtube Google Almost Podcast. Fun. Google Podcast. Um, email is philatelypodcast at gmail.com. Philatelypodcast at gmail.com. If anyone wants to reach out to us, uh, again, this is Conversations with Philatelists. I'm Charles Epting. Michael Cortese. Thank you for listening, and uh, we'll, we'll see you next week. Absolutely.